So the domain of a function is the set of all possible inputs for a function as defined by the function. The creator of the function may further restrict the domain by stating any restrictions in the setup of the problem. Now, what does that mean? When we consider all possible inputs for a function, we're really asking, is there anything we shouldn't be plugging into this function? Now, different functions have different rules. If you think about things like square roots, we don't wanna take the square root of a negative number. That leads to things that we are not ready to deal with in this course and doesn't result in a number for us. So when we talk about things like the domain, we're talking about what we can and cannot plug in to different functions. Similarly, the range of a function is the set of all possible outputs for a function while considering the domain of the function. So the range tells you all possible outputs for the function. Sometimes that's everything. Sometimes you can get every single number out with no problem, but other times you can only get certain sets of numbers. Consider the function x squared. If you think about x squared, all of the outputs are gonna have to be positive. So what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to go on a case by case basis to determine the domain and range of different functions. So let's go ahead and look at some of our examples here and determine the domain and range for each of these different types of functions. So remember our formula from before, x squared minus 2x minus 3. The first thing we want to do is we want to think about the domain. We want to consider if there's anything that we should not be plugging into this function. Again, this type of function is called a polynomial. And polynomials are pretty nice because they're well behaved and they often are easy to work with. So one of the things that I like to do when I'm considering domain and range and to think about whether or not there are things I can and cannot plug in is I ask myself, can I plug in something positive? Can I plug in something negative? Can I plug in zero? I always figure that's a good starting point. So here, if I plug in something positive, I could plug in a one. So if I plugged in a one here, I would have one squared minus two times one minus three. So when I carefully plug that into my calculator or calculate it out in my head, I'm gonna get negative four. I have no problems plugging in a one. I'm also gonna plug in zero. So I have zero squared minus two times zero minus three. So here I get zero minus zero minus three is gonna give me negative three. And I'm also gonna plug in a negative number for good measure. So negative one squared is gonna be positive one. I gotta be a little careful here with all my negatives. The second term, I have minus two times negative one. So that actually becomes a plus. So here, this is gonna be positive one plus two minus three. And that's gonna give me zero. So again, I have no problem plugging any of these numbers in. However, I really wanna make sure I understand what I can and can't plug in. And sometimes it's helpful when you have a formula to draw a picture of what is happening. So here, if I were to take this function and I were to graph it, I would have a good sense of what I can and cannot plug in. So here, if I were to graph this picture, it's gonna be a parabola, which looks like a cup, and it's gonna come down like this. It's gonna come down through negative one, right? Because I said negative one has a value of zero. And then it's going to come down and turn around right about here. So I know at one, I should have a value of negative four. And then, if I test some other numbers, or if I graph it on a calculator, I will see that it's gonna turn around and come back up, and it's gonna come up through three. So it roughly looks like this. It doesn't shoot off to infinity, it doesn't have any holes or weird things. I also wanna look at my function and see if there's anything that contains a denominator, which it doesn't, or a square root, which it doesn't. So I'm pretty confident that my domain here is gonna be 
all real numbers. So what that means, real numbers, is every possible number you can think of and write down. Numbers that are not real are complex numbers, things like I, which we don't consider in this course. So all real numbers. So I know what I want to say here in terms of the domain, that I can plug in anything I want. However, I don't have the mathematical notation yet to do that. So that's something that we need to talk about. So how do we write down and express this set of numbers that we've determined to be the domain of the function? So we have what's called interval notation. So there's two types of interval notation, and it's called closed interval notation. And then we also have open interval notation, which we'll talk about in a minute. So closed interval notation is used when you're going to include the endpoints of your function. Open interval notation is used when you do not include the endpoints of your function. So we need to consider if our function has any endpoints. So our function, we said we could plug in anything we want. And that goes on forever. So we could plug in a 1, a 2, a 3, a 4, a 5. And it goes on and on and on and on. So that means that I can go off to infinity in the positive direction or negative infinity in the negative direction in terms of what I can plug in for x. So that means that my interval is going to be negative infinity to positive infinity. When we talk about infinity, we always use open interval notation for that. So when we talk about this particular function, we are going to say x is an element of negative infinity to infinity. So when we talk about open interval notation, that word open means we're going to use parentheses to represent what's happening at the endpoints. The parentheses indicate that you are not including the endpoints. Now, let's talk about the range of this function. So the range of this function is interesting because if you notice, the endpoints here, they're going to go on and on forever in the upward direction, which means that the y values can get infinitely big, right? We can have a million, 10 million, 20 million, on and on. However, in the other direction, we do have a minimum point here, which means that the y values can't go any lower than the lowest point on this function. So how do we determine what that lowest point is? Well, like I said before, sometimes it's a really good idea to graph your function. Because when you graph your function, you can visually see what is represented and figure out where things happen. So here, I have a pretty good sense that the lowest value that I'm going to get in terms of my outputs is going to be negative 4. If you graph it carefully and you plug in a lot of numbers near x equals 1, you will find that negative 4 is indeed the lowest value, which means that my range, or my y values, are going to go from negative 4 to positive infinity. What you see on the left-hand side is a closed bracket. So that square bracket tells me that I'm going to include the negative 4 as a possible value of my outputs, and then that can go all the way up to infinity. So those are the set of outputs that I can have. So that's a demonstration of some closed interval notation and some open interval notation for continuous functions. This function is continuous because it can take on every value. So when we use this type of notation, it says that you can get every value between the two values listed. So for example, in the range, I can get anything between negative 4 and infinity. I could get 0. I could get 1. I could get pi. I could get lots of lots of decimal numbers, as long as they're between negative 4 and infinity. So this notation is used for continuous functions.